Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Neeraj Kalori from Virginia, United States. Dr. Kalori is Associate Professor of Orthopedics at the Virginia Common Health University Health System with interest in sports medicine and joint reconstruction. After completing his residency at St. G.S. Medical College in Mumbai, Dr. Kalori pursued his adult reconstruction fellowship at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Minneapolis and also a sports medicine fellowship at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, United States. Dr. Kalori serves on the editorial board of Arthroscopy and also on the social media editorial board for Arthur's Anna, and he's also a reviewer for several leading journals. He holds a U.S. patent for automated hip analysis methods and devices, which he filed last year. He's published widely in journals of arthroscopy and arthroplasty and also won several awards, including the best poster award at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons annual meeting and also has presented several papers at the ARCUS and the ANA meetings. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Neeraj Kalori for this wonderful live program. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan, for that kind introduction and for running this wonderful session. Uh, today, our topic is total knee implant design. Uh, before I start, I would like to say that this is a really vast topic with so many variations that keep coming every day that it is not possible to cover each and everything. It is also not possible to get into details of the outcomes of these designs. So I have tried to stick to key principles and a format that you can apply to evaluation of any implant design. So my objectives today are to understand the key concepts of the how the native or natural knee functions and to analyze how different implant designs try to replicate the native knee function and to understand the risks, benefits and the summary key outcomes of different implant designs. The format of uh, each implant design assessment is to assess the articular geometry the ligament function and kinematics and finish up with the risk benefits and key outcomes. So what I have done is for the most important designs, uh, it goes into more details. As we go into less common designs, it's more kind of a summary and a consolidated format. So first of all, and the most valuable part of this talk is how the natural knee functions. So first aspect of that is the articular geometry. So as you well know, in the coronal plane, uh, the medial and the lateral sides are not symmetric. The medial femoral condyle projects more distal than the lateral. Uh, the medial tibial plateau is more distal than the lateral. So it, it is an asymmetric joint line with the medial joint line distal than the lateral. In the sagittal plane, things are a bit more complex. Uh, in the, if you look at the first radiograph, you will see the more posteriorly and distally projecting medial femoral condyle, the concave medial tibial plateau. Uh, and on the second radiograph, you will see the lateral femoral condyle, which is more anterior is more proximal. The tibial plateau is convex in the societal plane. Mind well that it is concave in the coronal plane. So the medial side is more congruent. The lateral side is less congruent. It doesn't stop here. It gets even more complex if you go into the details of it. So these, the radius of curvature of the distal and the posterior condyles are different on the medial and the lateral side. On the lateral side, there is a large difference in the radius of curvature in the distal and the posterior condyles, and that helps to drive the posterior femoral roll back. Uh, the posterior condyle center of rotation is closer to the posterior cortex, and that helps with the roll back. On the medial side, the two radii of curvature for the distal and the posterior condyles, they are closer. So there is low, less role for rollback and this is more uh, of a convex uh, single surface. In the axial plane, uh, it is not just a hinge joint. There is some degree of rotation there. Notice that the medial tibial plateau is larger and longer than the lateral tibial plateau. 
and also because of the way the femoral condyle geometry is as the knee rolls back the medial side moves less than the lateral side and there is more motion as there is deeper flexion so it is kind of a medial pivot design where the medial side stays more constant lateral slide translates more but that is not entirely true uh, when you are doing uh, flexion like moderate flexion you are just climbing stairs you are not doing medial pivot it may just be equal pivot or a variable pivot or maybe even a lateral pivot the medial pivot really engages in deep flexion like when you are squatting now we try to understand the ligament function and there are two important things concepts to understand here one is the posterior femoral roll back where with knee flexion especially deep flexion which is more than 90 degrees the contact point of the femur rolls posteriorly and this avoids impingement between the posterior edge of the femur or the posterior condyles and the posterior edge of the tibial plateau this helps to clear the bony impingement and permit more flexion also notice the tibia rotates internally during this mechanism because of the geometry and the pcl is the critical ligament for posterior femoral roll back so this roll back is controlled one by geometry and two by the pcl also notice that it's not really the femur that's rolling is the posterior is it is the contact point that moves posteriorly the second important uh mechanism to understand is the screw home mechanism where as the knee goes into terminal extension which is like 15 degree to 0 degrees of extension the tibia rotates externally this improves the extension stability and acl is the key ligament for screw home mechanism now we uh i haven't talked about the outcomes of a native knee as you well know i mean it is the longest lasting least coefficient of friction works perfectly for a very long length of time and we basically try to copy that as much as we can we have made a lot of progress but what we have been doing is altering the knee trying to make it simple and that ends up being a functional knee but where it doesn't satisfy the patient fully to the extent that they say about 18 20% people are not satisfied with their knee replacement also in in uh, activities like kneeling sports or running uh, stair climbing or stair descent more often uh, the knee is less than satisfactory and the background on how the native knee functions will help you understand the next parts so these this is a classification of total knee implant design that that i made based on how the cruciate ligaments are handled how the articular geometry is handled and how the constraint is made so the classic uh, way this is classified is non constrained constrained and highly constrained in the non constrained uh, the one with that retains both ligament is the bicruciate retaining the one that retains the pcl is the cruciate retaining one that substitutes for the pcl is the posterior stabilize one that provides an anterior stabilization with retention of pcl is anterior stabilize cr in intermediate constraint there is medial pivot a fairly popular design these days also anterior stabilize which is also known as ultra congruent or deep dish uh, bicruciate stabilized which is uh, basically the double cam mechanism constrained uh, is a constrained non hinge tk and highly uh, constrained is a hinge tk that's all levels of constraint together so we'll go a little bit into back to the coronal plane and what exactly we do with a knee replacement long time back when they plan to do knee replacements they made the cuts in a mechanical way so that they are perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia and the femur uh, what that does it loads the compartments evenly that part is good but what it does it completely alters the joint line because natural joint line is asymmetric we cut it 
where it is uh, perpendicular to the mechanical axis and then we try to resurface it with a symmetric component what that does if you look at the first picture here this is the natural knee medial joint line is distal than the lateral the red line is where we made the distal femoral cut this is the medial tibial surface which is concave and distal this is the lateral tibial surface which is uh, concave in this plane and is more proximal uh, this was the medial joint line this was the lateral joint line and this is where we cut it and we resurface that with a symmetric tibia and a symmetric femur what that does is if we are matching the medial joint line that is restored but the lateral joint line has not been restored. In fact, it has been distalized in this case. If we try to match the lateral joint line, then we're not matching the medial joint line. So this is like a never ending game of balancing and matching the knee. Uh, even though this functions, this does function in an abnormal way. And this may have something to do with why our patients are not fully satisfied with their knee replacements. Now compare this with this particular uh, uh, graphic where we have used a asymmetric femoral component and asymmetric tibial component on top of cuts that are perpendicular to the mechanical axis. So the cuts are made the same traditional way which are still easy to make, but the components are asymmetric. Now this was not so easy many years back, maybe a decade back, but now with 3D printing and so forth and improvements in manufacturing techniques, this has become possible. So this may be the future where we make the easy cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis and use asymmetric components to, to make an asymmetric uh, joint line that mimics the natural knee. And that may be the next evolution of knee replacement. So coming to the traditional kind of the workhorse, cruciate retaining total knee replacement. Now each of the designs, we're going to look at articular geometry, how the ligaments are going to function and what are the benefits, problems and key outcomes of it. So for cruciate retaining, this is a round on flat design. The inserts are generally flat. The medial and lateral sides are symmetric. So the joint line is symmetric. Uh, regarding the ligament function, the ACL is lost, removed, not existent, and the PCL is retained. Additionally, these are put in a slope that copies the natural slope. So that's kind of one mechanism to make it function. But the PCL is the one that regulates the flexion stability. It controls the rollback. Regarding kinematics, because of loss of ACL function, uh, there is anterior sliding, which would have been na uh, naturally restrained by the ACL as there is no ACL or ACL substituting mechanism. There is a, a paradoxical motion where there is anterior sliding and also there is no pivot because that is symmetric. The Benefits of this is, of course, bone preserving because the uh, there's no box cut. The ACL is retained, so proprioception is maintained. These are non-controversial aspects. Uh, problems of this can be, PCL can be hard to balance, and uh, there are refined ways how to balance it. You can watch the videos on UV, on View Medi on exactly how to balance. This uh, series of pictures from Miller shows a uh, balancing attempt where if you see in deep flexion, the tibial insert is lifting off, indicating a tight flexion space, and they are gradually releasing the PCL. And the result is that the insert is not lifting off. This is a fine technique. It's not always as easy as it seems, and that's the problem there. Also, if the PCL ruptures uh, after the surgery, then you do not have the PCL restraint, so you get flexion instability, and that's a known problem. Now, outcomes, I really hesitated to put this slide, but this is what I found was reported, is that there's more than 90% survivorship at 15 years. 
this becomes very controversial. This is one center study with thousands of patients, uh, a very experienced group of authors, and they found there's increased survivorship with CR compared to PS. People will go on arguing this for a long time, but I mean, that's what is out there. Uh, posterior stabilized total knee. Again, the articular geometry, this is more of a dished insert. So there is more conformity. There is a cam and post design. The medial and lateral sides are symmetric. The cam engages the post in flexion and tries to substitute for the PCL function. And the cam and post controls the rollback. Ligament function, of course, the ACL is removed. PCL is removed, but there is a substitution mechanism with cam and post. The kinematics in extension, where the ACL restrains anterior translation, there is more posterior contact, and there is more AP translation in flexion. Rollback is present, it is not a natural rollback, but there is at least a definite rollback mechanism. There is no pivoting as the sides, the two sides are symmetric. Non-controversial benefits of this balancing is easier. The exposure is easier because there is no PCL that you are trying to save. So you have good access to the posterior side. Then there is a definite rollback mechanism. The downside says you are removing more bone for the box cut there is a higher risk of fracture that can arise from it, especially in elderly people. Uh, you're removing the posterior cruciate ligament, so there's less proprioception. Problems of this uh, can be many. Uh, one is unique to this is a cam jump, where because of a loose flexion gap, uh, there can be a jump in deep flexion, uh, and that can be a difficult problem. And can be reduced, but it's usually ends up needing a revision. Also notice in this that the posterior offset was not restored. And that may be one reason why the posterior gap is too much open. Other problems with it would be post wear fracture. It does provide an additional surface for wear. Uh, a lot has changed in the way the cross section of the post is made. It is not as rectangular uh, to reduce some of these problems. Uh, another unique problem to this is patellar clunk syndrome, more so when you have a small patella, when you have a wider box, or when you have the increased uh, condylar box height. But basically what happens is there is a, a sort of a scar tissue nodule that forms superior to the patellar component and that engages in the box in deep flexion. And this can be treated with uh, scar debridement, open or arthroscopic, can also end up needing a revision. This is again that paper from Mayo Clinic, large number of patients, respected group of authors from 2011, that showed 77% survivorship, which is remarkably less than the CR. However, this is probably one of the most commonly used designs, if not the most common. Uh, now we go to sort of the less commonly used designs, but all of these have been uh, the attempted improvements of the CR and PS. This one is bi cruciate stabilized. I think only one implant manufacturer makes this. There is an anterior and posterior cam. The articular geometry is symmetric on both sides. And uh, the attempt is to substitute both anterior and posterior cruciate ligament function with the cam post mechanism. Uh, there is at least a reduced paradoxical motion. Long-term results are not as clear. By long-term, I mean 15, 20 year results. Uh, this is another interesting uh, popular design these days is the anterior stabilized or the ultra congruent. Regarding articular geometry, this is basically a CR insert with a high anterior lip, sometimes also with a high posterior lip. Uh, the PCL is sacrificed, but there is no cam and post mechanism. The idea was that you save that bone and uh, reduce the problems associated with it. 
However, in kinematic studies, there is definitely more sagittal plane laxity in an anterior stabilized knee compared to a PS knee. Uh, benefit, of course, is this bone preserving. And because there is more laxity, more sliding, there is more wear. There are some reports of not having adequate rollback and so less range of motion and maybe even higher rates of manipulation. Next very popular design these days is a medial pivot knee. This is a not a symmetric design. Here we're trying to create the medial pivot. So there is a more congruent medial articulation and a less congruent lateral articulation. Uh, in this, the PCL is usually substituted and uh, the ligament function is being mimicked through the articular geometry. Uh, in kinematic studies, it does show the medial pivot in deep flexion. It does not show the variable pivot in uh, less than deep flexion. Like you are doing stair climbing, you are probably not going to get the medial pivot. It does show kinematics that gets closer to the natural knee, uh, but not quite. There are several, several reports suggesting that there is more patient satisfaction with this particular design. This is a very new design. I'm not sure if there are any significant outcome studies available, but the articular geometry is symmetric. There is an anterior asymmetric post that substitutes the ACL without getting in the way of the PCL and the PCL is retained. Uh, there is reduced paradoxical motion. And again, the, the knee's kinematics is closer to normal, even though not perfectly normal. Next is the bicruciate retaining design. This has been around for a long time with several uh, updates and modifications. Uh, again, this is medial and lateral sides being symmetric in the articular geometry. The ACL and PCL are retained in the central island. There is a more gradual rollback. This is different from the PS knee where the rollback is not gradual because it's controlled only by one ligament, not by geometry. Here, the rollback is controlled by two ligaments, again, not by geometry. Uh, there is no pivoting in this particular knee. This is technically very difficult in terms of exposure, in terms of trying to protect the central bone island setting the rotation of the tibial component uh, because you have a big block of bone in between that you are trying to preserve. So these are much harder and there is a risk of fracture of that bone island. Also the rotation of the tibia is constrained by that bone island. So there is very little room for variation. So it is the rotation the knee gives you and there can be malrotation with this. Outcomes are still awaited. I mean, long-term outcomes. Now, this is the most promising one based on kinematics. This is biomimetic, bicruciate retaining, where the articular geometry mimics the natural knee, where you have asymmetric medial and lateral side, you have an asymmetric joint line, you are keeping the ACL and the PCL. So in this case, both the ligament and the articular geometry help with the pivot. This is nearly natural kinematics. There is nearly natural pivoting. Again, technically, this is very difficult. And the bone island fracture risk and the malrotation risk on the tibia exists with this one as well. Then we go to the semi-constrained total knee where there is, this is a non-hinge one. There's a large post and cam mechanism that provides varus valgus stability and rotational stability. And the constraint, which is uh, uh, basically like a hinge knee. Uh, both of these designs have increased polywear, increased post damage, increased rates of aseptic loosening, because the more constraint you add, the more wear you get. And stems are required uh, for these designs to reduce the stresses on the uh, condylar surfaces. This is another interesting variation uh, is a mobile bearing knee replacement. Uh, the idea was to reduce the polyethylene wear, trying to reduce the, uh, trying to uh, dissipate some of the stresses that happen at the 
uh, femoral component tibial interface by dissipating through rotation. Uh, however, there still has problems with backside wear. Uh, Long-term survivorship are said to be equivalent. Uh, this is a slide showing the backside wear on, on the backside of the uh, tibial insert. A unique problem of this can be bearing spin out because there is no rotational constraint on the tibial insert. If the knee is not properly balanced, if it gets in a unique position, it can actually uh, rotate 90 degrees. This radiograph shows it where you can see these two metal uh, pins, which should be anterior are facing kind of lateral. And of course, that's probably going to need a revision for proper balancing. So this one, uh, depends highly on a good technique, is less tolerant of poor balance. But there are proponents of using this that will stick by it. All polytubia does not have the modularity. So there's no question of any backside wear. However, because of not having modularity, if you have an infection, you had to end up taking the whole component out and you don't have the luxury of just changing the insert. Uh, function is similar. Aseptic loosening is similar, is quite cheaper. And that's the main uh, benefit of that one. Uh, briefly about cemented and uh, uncemented fixation. Cemented fixation is the current gold standard. The big benefit of this is immediate rigid fixation. Cement is strong against compression, but it is weak in shear and tension. So there is potential for aseptic loosening arising from it. Also, because of cement particles, there is a risk of third body wear, but there are good long-term 20, 30 year data for cemented fixation, because this is how it was started. Cementless fixation is again, gaining popularity, short data is only short term, but uh, it has written back. Uh, initially, they made this with the porous surfaces like we use for hip and knee replacements. Now with the advent of highly porous metal, this is again getting in favor where the tritanium or any kind of a highly porous metal, which is similar to cancellous bone and helps promote the ingrowth, provides a lot of friction and initial stability. Uh, however, there is uh, there are reports suggesting there is early period of pain and micro migration, but once it uh, ingrows, uh, it is quite durable. The fixation is biologic and it is very resistant to aseptic loosening. There is also no third body wear. The cost is higher and the data is short term. This is another interesting design where there is no modularity. The tibial poly is factory pressed on trabecular metal base plate. Uh, and that eliminates the backside wear. There are good results available from the Mayo Clinic for this particular design. This is a summary of the multiple implant designs. Talks about how the ACL is handled, how the PCL is handled, and how the articular geometry is handled. So by cruciate retaining, uh, total knee, ACL is intact, PCL is intact, the articular geometry is symmetric. In the biomimetic variety of bicruciate retaining design, both cruciates are retained and the articular surface mimics native joint surface. This is the knee replacement that most closely mimics what is in a natural knee at this time. In a cruciate retaining design, the ACL is out, the PCL is intact, the medial and lateral sides are symmetric, it's a round on flat design. Anterior stabilized cruciate retaining uh, knee replacement. The ACL is being substituted with an anterior cam post mechanism. PCL is intact and the geometry is symmetric. Posterior stabilized design, ACL is out. PCL is substituted with a posterior cam post mechanism and it's a symmetric design. Bicruciate stabilized, ACL and PCL, both are substituted by anterior and posterior cam post respectively and it's a symmetric design. Medial pivot, ACL and PCL are usually out. Some, there are some reports where they try to keep the PCL, but there is conflict between that geometry and PCL. So it's generally recommended you take out the PCL. 
this is more conforming medially the ultra congruent or anterior stabilized design both acl pcl are out there is a high anterior and sometimes a high posterior lip and it's a symmetric design the semi constrained where there is a tall post trying to replace the acl as well as pcl it's a symmetric design constrained which is fully constrained there is a hinge there that is substituting acl pcl also providing rotational uh, stability and it's a symmetric design so any questions thank you neeraj for a very very comprehensive presentation on uh, total knee designs neeraj few questions one is what do you think is the most common one is it the posterior stabilized and why is it why do you think it is do you think it is a more forgiving implant for example if you are using cr or a mobile bearing you need to have your balancing perfect right yes so i think a lot of this is a combination of what we want to achieve and what we can achieve i mean when we go in actually in the operating room theater we want something that is predictable that can be consistently reproduced so my go to design is a posterior stabilized uh, design for a lot of people that is true i do sometimes do the cr but uh, not that commonly and the outcomes are similar right cr versus ps i mean we have conferences where every year you have the same debate cr ps cr ps yeah you know i put that slide and i took it out and i put that back and this <laughs> let do it or not do it because it is always very controversial you could not say one thing and not be questioned on it so okay. i mean the literature goes both ways i think if we put the whole thing together there is probably not such a real life difference thank you neeraj and neeraj central is also around central is a staff orthopedic surgeon based in uh, texas you know central already central hey uh so no, nice talk neeraj it's yeah, like a uh, uh, hitesh was telling like this is a very extensive topic and you comprehensively covered it uh, and uh, yeah again uh, this is a debate that goes on forever at the end of the day the, the choice of implant depends on a surgeon's preference and his training background i that's what i believe you know so i am a strong cr surgeon uh, pretty much 98% of my knees are cr for primary knees you know so uh, and uh, you know like i for if you kind of uh, if i try to debate for a cr i would always say there are studies that say ps is as good as cr or slightly inferior whether you take individual series or like uh, registry data but i am yet to see or i that i am not aware of um the where ps is better than cr in long term studies definitely we know that uh, ps gives a little bit more flexion uh, almost 8 degree more flexion uh, and uh, their recovery is much quicker um but you know um uh, what's your uh, so you mostly do ps knees uh, niraj well i mean that's true at this time but you know how that goes is i mean i have changed from ps to cr cr to ps move back and forth back and forth but i would say i do more ps than cr especially when i work in peripheral hospitals where you don't mm-hmm. always have the same consistent crew everything kind of changes so having less variables in the surgery helps mm-hmm. if you always mm-hmm. operate in one center have the same consistent crew you could but okay. uh, if you operate in different hospitals and you are moving from place to place you have a different crew they don't know what it is it's helpful to have less inventory less steps less variables okay that's and you talked about cs so do you see a role because it's more bone conserving you don't take the big big box especially in small females um what what do you where do you think the, the cs is going to have a role in the future do you think it's as, as good as ps definitely has a role it does not provide the same degree of stability as a ps it has less uh-huh. noise generation and it is definitely more bone conserving so if i had to use it like you said in a small female where you don't want to make that box cut it's a uh-huh. nice option to have yeah so that's that's good um yeah this is a topic we can go on talking you know like as this it so it is and yeah so that's, that's the beauty of uh, the implant design you know that's what all uh, most of us is a very uh, topic that's very close to our heart you know so um i think uh, uh what what about uh, the 
by crochet have you used any i have not used any by crochet okay so okay, when people do that do they use two separate arthrotomies how do they expose it you said the exposure is difficult you do, are you aware of anybody who uses a by crochet uh, not in my institution we're not mm -hmm. using by crochets but it would make sense to just do a regular medial parapetal arthrotomy if you're trying to do something difficult because that's where you have the best exposure i mean two arthrotomies run into destroying the vascularity of the patella so i think that would uh -huh. be a bad idea. that's right uh -huh. so that's great uh pitesh i don't have any more questions so you have okay uh neera just one last question before you wind up what do you think is the role for a high flex knee because in the last decade we discussed in i mean almost all the meetings there was a lot of hype about the high flex the remo additional posterior condyle and you're able to achieve yeah. more flexion but studies have not really i mean able to find a true advantage with the high flex yeah. knee and also a higher revision rate with the high, high flex what is it take on that and what is the current status so i think it provides maybe 3 degrees of additional flexion if that is worth anything because that's less than the minimal clinically important difference that's where that knee implant design did not actually make it uh i mean it's a nice concept to do it what i routinely do is i remove the posterior femoral uh, i mean the uh, any bone that is behind the uh, resurface condyle uh, that way it's not impinging Uh, but i do not use that particular design i think that's a debate that's a little bit has and passed. there were some concerns about higher revision rate the high flex our korean surgeon initially came out with that there's a high, he said that almost 38% increase risk of revision in his hands way back so do you yeah. think that it's still there or do you have patients that come for a revision who have undergone a high flex knee i do not see that too commonly here Okay, Neeraj. Ah, uh, any more questions, Anil, or shall we wind up the session? Uh, I think, ah, uh, uh, Neeraj, just one last question. So, I'm not sure if you can, ah, uh, like, out of rating is one of the commonly used uh, rating, at least in Europe, but it's not that popular in North America. It's about uh, choosing your implant based on the outcome. Ah, uh, do you use it when you when you when you are trying to jump on an implant? You want to change, you know? Do you use it as a tool, or do you kind of ah? Uh, orient your residents to that i have not used that as a tool but that is a discussion we definitely have that an implant should have a track record a track record and the minimum track record for using like a joint replacement is at least 10 years maybe even more so if something doesn't have that you always are very skeptical about i mean we should always study those designs but when it comes to using it i do not lead the like the innovation curve stay behind watch the results and then kind of try to use i i, I agree because you know, the reason i brought it up is you showed a lot of newer designs the the, the medial pivot and uh, all those things i don't want people all over the world to jump on it you know like i think uh, uh, trying this kind of a newer design should be limited to high volume surgeons or, or uh, trained surgeons Uh, so and then once the results are out then others can uh, jump on it yeah. yeah so there's a lot of marketing about it a lot of press on it which is kind of misguiding for arthroplasty surgeons i think like you said um, a standard way of making decisions for choosing implant would be very nice yeah i i stick to order operating so most of the time not always but i stay with the either a 7a implant 10a or a 10a star implant so um that's that's my that's why when our vendor comes to me and say hey we have something new do you want to try I always say no you know like yeah. a, uh it's well, as long as uh, when it comes to the core implant designs you know so well, i like to look at it but i don't actually use it yes exactly the way <laughs> so great Okay, thank you, Sandal, thank you. I think uh, there are no more questions to Dr. Neeraj, and thank you, Neeraj, for this fantastic presentation. You've done a lot of lectures with us, and they all reached to a big audience all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in. Also, Sandal, thank you.